So I will be talking to you today about a few projects that we've done under the general aegis of human machine teaming. Uh, probably the first important thing that I should mention is um, if you're interested in meeting with me after the after this talk, I'm not physically on campus this year. I'm on sabbatical, so currently at Harvard. I'll talk about the work that I'm doing here at the end of the talk. Normally, I would be teaching the undergraduate robotics courses that are required for the intelligent robotics uh, system minor. Um, I also teach a graduate seminar on agents and robots. I've taught the graduate undergraduate machine learning course. And as a new thing, we're hoping to do a master's program in robotics and autonomous systems uh, starting next fall. So we're trying to push that through the approval process now. Um, in terms of where I review and publish, um, primarily this conference, Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems. It's a top distributed AI conference. I've served as program chair, general chair on the supervisory board. I also review for several of the AI conferences, um, the American AI Conference, which is one of the, the best. And I've served as um, a board member for DARPA's ISAT panel, which makes uh, kind of recommendations about um, future funding uh, initiatives. So at UCF, I direct the Intelligent Agents Lab. Um, I've graduated 16 PhD students, and I have another two more who would like to graduate this semester. And we do a lot of work on the use of AI for human behavior modeling. And we look at a variety of social computational systems. So our general philosophy is that we're very data-driven. We start with data from a variety of sources, user experiences, social media, game simulations. We, um, do, we apply machine learning to this. Today's talk is going to be primarily talking about the machine learning work done by my group. And sometimes we try to build agent-based social simulations. Now, the problem of human machine teaming, I say is kind of a general problem that covers all these situations where human and machine are working together, but the, um, the responsibilities are not necessarily clearly defined. Teams are so important, but yet they're often so frustrating. So in the figure on the left, we see kind of the worst teamwork situation where half the people are rowing in one direction, the other half are rowing in the other. This is very bad because teams are critical for tasks such as um, medical teams, um, for computer science, software engineering teams. And uh, of course, that this is important for the military, that military teams. The agents community has been looking at this problem for a long time so that there was work done back in 2002, uh, a system called Team Core. And they said, OK, we can we can create these nice um, agent wrappers such that each human in the system had a would have a proactive assistant agent that would um, handle these communications. And that the nice thing about this kind of system is it can be extended to include agents and robots there. However, there are a lot of um, problems that, that come up, uh, mainly that humans are not necessarily rational actors. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk to you about today is work that we've done at detecting coordination failures, inferring workloads, selecting agent interventions, and bolstering the human's trust in autonomy. So kind of one, you know, one, so DARPA recognized this as an important problem so that they, they fund, funded us for work through their program, Artificial Social Intelligence for Successful Teams. Steve Fiore at IST was the PI. And essentially DARPA really wanted to look to see how well agents could support human teams. And the idea was that a key ability would be to imbue these agents with theory of mind so that they were inf effective in inferring um, the intention of the human, human team members. So this being DARPA, they created a benchmark task that there would be teams that would be working on a simulated search and rescue task and that we would be creating agents that would help those teams or in the case of our, our UCF, 
team, what we'd be doing is we'd be creating analytics for analyzing um, different aspects of the team. So this is the analytic system that my PhD student, Sheng Nan Hu, created. And what we did was that, you know, very simply that it, it's important to understand how the team is doing at the task. So for the search and rescue task, we wanted to be able to monitor the, the team progress and basically predict over a short time window how they, how they were scoring. So we built this graph convolutional neural network system. And probably the kind of the most innovative thing about it is that it's able to leverage the field of view features. So what we're doing is we're looking at what each team member sees and pulling, the, pulling that information into our network and we're weighting it together with our graph convolutional network, which creates this representation that incorporates the spatial features. We're weighting these features by the inverse distance of the team members. We have some recurrent, uh, recurrent layers to handle um, the fact that this is occurring over a period of time. And then we predict how the, how the team is doing. And we did a bake-off and we showed that this outperformed a lot of the standard, standard models that you would use on this. Now, this was great, but the thing is, it's pretty task specific. So the, the idea of using field of view is, is general, but that this model, once trained for this task, doesn't do well on other tasks. So we wanted to look at more generalized things. And an important part for these teams is, of course, communication. So looking at the communication between, between team members. And we were particularly interested in predicting process conflict, which is essentially cases where team members are disagreeing about the course of action. So in terms of looking at prior work on NLP, it's fairly straightforward to do um, sentiment analysis to look at the emotions of the team members. There's been some prior work done on the use of entrainment. It turns out that when team members are in sync, what they can do is they actually copy each other's phrases syntactically. This is something that we can detect, detect. But kind of the new thing we wanted to look at was sequences of dialogues. So looking at the sequences of questions and acknowledgments and so forth. Again, what we're able to do is put this into a neural network architecture. We built a specific classifier for dialogue acts, which we've made publicly available. And we wanted to look really strongly at this problem of generalizability. So machine in machine learning, data is king, but in these teamwork problems, we don't have much data because it's expensive collecting data. So our, our data sets are typically under 100 examples. However, we have many small data sets. So we wanna look at the problem of domain adaptation. So can you train your model on, for instance, people who are doing this search and rescue task and apply it to coordination between software engineers? This ends up being um, a daunting problem in some ways because of vocabulary shifts so that the, the software engineers are using very different technical terms than the search and rescue, rescue team. So we did a, lo a lot of work in, in this area. And what we were trying to do was to create a generalizable embedding in which the embedding is the representation. So NLP already has a lot of embeddings that were built on very large data sets. So we showed in this study that we that our embedding, which uses these sequences of dialogue acts among other things, outperforms kind of some of these standard uh, big data NLP embeddings. And essentially what we're using is the, this, this idea that good teams execute something called loop closure, that they are team members will acknowledge other team members' communications. And so that's why that this kind of um, system generalizes across these different cooperative problem solving domains. And then another thing that people are very concerned with in these proactive uh, assistant agents is determining when the agent should intervene. When is a good time for the agent to step in and help? And psychologists have this concept of workload, which, which can be measured, but it's usually measured as, as part of a post-task questionnaire. 
Our idea is, of course, that we would like to be able to do the workload modeling in real time. And that this is an area where having multiple types of physiological sensors can really help us. So there's been a lot of work on the use of gaze tracking, heart monitors, galvanic skin response, EEGs for this kind of, kind of problem. And that in order to utilize all these features, there are a few different ways of fusing, fusing them. There are kind of early fusion architectures where you just concatenate all the features together, uh, kind of use that, use them all together. Late fusion in which you use each modality separately classify at the end. What we do is we created a hybrid um, tensor fusion network where we treat each modality separately. We learn a separate embedding for each modality, but we also use a tensor fusion network to learn the correlation between different, different modalities. So we were able to show that um, our method outperforms other types of fusion methods on the HP workload modeling data set. So um, that's kind of an overview of my work at UCF. At Harvard, I've been told that I've officially joined the CIRCUS. So CIRCUS is their acronym for Center for Research on Computation and Society. They have two main thrusts. One of them is looking at public health problems. The other is looking at wildlife conservation. It's very likely, um, I'm only in my first week here, but that I will be working with them on the public health side. That's where I have the most experience. And essentially the issue is that in these scenarios, there are just so few resources, so many people. So really what you want to do is to identify in your large community, who are the influencers in the social network? Who can you reach with your health messaging and look at that? For the wildlife conservation, their work is primarily on monitoring wildlife using sensor networks and also deterring poachers. So they have a few different game theoretic formulations for that. So that's where I'm going to be uh, for the next few, few months. So um, if my talk interests you, I've edited a volume on computational theory of mind for human machine uh, teaming. I'm giving a talk at the AAAI Fall Symposium on agent teaming in mixed motive situations. I still have ongoing work at the UCF campus that I didn't get a chance to cover, work with ARL on understanding how AI techniques like learning from demonstration affect the user's trust and autonomy. And also for NLP work, what we're interested in doing is making bringing our tools out of the research lab and making them simpler for other users, medical researchers to use. What's commonly done is that there's a tool called LOOC that's a word counting tool that they use for natural language representation. And so we're going to be making our tools available to researchers at UCSD's INSTEP um, Children's Mental Health Research Center. I'd really like to thank my terrific collaborators at IST, primarily Steve Fiore, who has really championed this area of human machine teaming as being one of critical importance and one that UCF is well poised to excel on. Uh, Sean Burke, who's done some of the seminal work on NLP type things for teams, Mary Jean Amon, and my collaborator with the Army, Julia Wright. Thank you.